good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Richard Ricky. I'm a board member of KPMG uh, Dubai, and I was ex-CEO of KPMG in India. The session which uh, we are going to be talking on today is reconceptualizing supply chain. I would like to introduce my esteemed panel members who are joining me on this important discussion. Uh, first, we have Donnie Yuang, who is the founder and managing director of Four Stones China, which is the first cross-cultural management firm in China. As a management consultant, Mr. Wang has worked with numerous large Chinese national corporations. He specializes in global leadership, cross-cultural consulting and training uh, and executive coaching. Uh, we also have uh, with us Barry Listing, uh, Lustig, sorry, uh, who's the founder of Cormorant Group, which is an executive search consulting firm focusing on uh, disciplines uh, related to brand and creative industries. Very rare kind of commodity. Barry, would love to uh, get from you your views. Barry founded this group, this company, to give a more thoughtful and personal approach to executive search for clients and candidates. Before establishing this company, Barry spent most of his career as a strategist in the communications industry. Uh, we have Wolfgang Lee Matcher, who's the operating partner at uh, Anchor Group and advisor to Topan AG. He's got a huge uh, uh, CV out here. I'm not going to read everything, uh, Wolfgang. I hope you're okay with that. He's a board member, executive director, and former head of supply chain and transport industries at World Economic Forum, as well as president and CEO emeritus of GeoPost Intercontinental and an advisory board member of the Logistics and Supply Chain Management Society, Singapore. So he knows everything about supply chain. So if any, so any question on supply chain, you know where to go. Uh, last but not the least, uh, we had one more panel member, but he's not joined, so I'll introduce when he comes. But last not but not the least is Hugo Ropel, who's the owner of GLG Logistics System, serial entrepreneur in the logistics and transport field and logistics system. So Wolfgang, you got competition here and software development. Uh, Hugo has been operating in, in business for the last 46 years, and he's currently based in Switzerland. Uh, so what the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to just give a few opening remarks, and then I'm going to uh, go and, uh, Rick and uh, ask questions to my panelists. So the global supply chain has been badly disrupted, as we know, during the pandemic. Um, and of course, during a lot of climate change issues and the recent Ukraine-Russia war has just added to it. So the supply chain was recovering in some ways. In fact, uh, we were just discussing before this how badly the supply chain has been hit. And the latest one, the Russia-Ukraine one, I know uh, Hugo was talking of certain products which are not coming in the market and the chips, etc. But I know somebody was talking of fertilizers which used to come from Ukraine to Brazil is getting impacted. And so we're going to see commodity prices going up. So this has impacted inflation in a big, big way. Many Western companies look to reducing their dependency on China for components and finished goods after the pandemic because they just wanted to have another source. But the current con conflict is now forcing companies to relook because now China, uh, Russia is there, oil, transportation, raw materials. People are now looking at more localized and uh, uh, regional sources. Many U.S. and European companies pulling out of Russia will have long-standing effects on the global on the global supply chain and will lead to global inflation, as we were talking earlier. Uh, India has already hit double-digit inflation, just from my perspective. Uh, considering Russia contributes significantly to areas including energy production, rare earth materials, that is the material which actually makes all those chips and those semiconductors. And of course, wheat disruption is affecting a lot of countries, though temporarily I think India has stepped up to supply some of that wheat. Uh, pandemic and similar ones have impact. Now it's going to be a very, uh, it's going to happen regularly, uh, this kind of thing. So we need a more permanent solution. I don't, I, I hope we can come with some ideas and suggestions how we can uh, fix this supply chain uh, issues that we have. And the question that I have is, can we make the supply chain anti-fragile and uh, work towards, uh, you know, governments and companies work towards that. So many governments and businesses have decided to bring back their production lines from other countries in order to be more resilient. I know people are trying to build their food security in their own countries, especially countries like Singapore, Middle East, etc. Uh, the benefits of the economy are many in terms for the local countries, many in terms of innovation, employment, and of course, attracting investments. 
because of reshoring global supply chains are going to change creating a new phase of globalization in my view so there's going to be new uh, global no new uh, world order will come in terms of how countries will interact with each other so there was already a momentum building to reshape this supply chain post covid i mean we saw supply chains actually getting really broken during uh, covid time and the ukraine conflict has put the spotlight even further and accelerating this movement to to go in that direction and so this will have to uh, so uh, so governments and companies will want to reshore or bring it back closer so there is less volatility and interdependence but onshoring isn't always possible some products and services such as semiconductors cannot be produced domestically in certain cases because of natural resources expertise or basically the market is not there you know the sufficiently to allow them to produce it a new term has emerged what is called friend shoring has emerged this is basically critical supply chains replacing foreign suppliers with close allies and partners and may offer some pragmatic solutions in the short term reshoring is helping countries restructure the value chains uh, uh, between them and also shortening the distance between where the goods are produced and where they are needed but the question is will reshoring alone be the answer to where Uh, there were there are other strategic measures required from different countries on this front i think these are some things that we will discuss today but i think this will require a lot amount of work on the government side for new cooperation agreements to cement a new structure of the world economy with this i will uh, i will um, uh, ask wolfgang i will come to you first uh, wolfgang uh, why do you why do local supply chains Struggle to complete with complete with global networks. Yeah. Um. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm always excited to to talk about this topic, which is kind of an evergreen. Um. So I'm I'm in this industry for decades. Um. Uh, but, uh, why why is it difficult uh, to build uh, supply chains? And um, we have be- before we got live spoken about automotive industry. We can spoke about aviation industry we can speak about aviation industry we can speak about electronics if you look at these industries they are in fact um very very much they are different and they are sometimes very much dependent on very high skilled labor so we we i uh, we think that the, the world is robotized right but we have 300 million people working in the factories so we have we have multiple dimensions here which make it difficult um i i think we had reached a point where we had a super oiled global machine um and there is a risk premium to that and we are paying currently the the risk premium right and unfortunately there is no no real insurance to fix that but that's a bit my my view um we have concentrated at yeah we could think that and that brought us very good products very low prices etc and that's already the reason why it's very hard to, to move now things around in the world and say okay we have a whole big country like mexico and why we put the electronics industry there um mexico is good in automotive but it's not good in electronics it is oil but it has not a very well developed oil industry so they are lacking engineers oil engineers in um, in mexico they have tried we always think that that it is a kind of a choice oh we have a choice we can pick electronics and we do electronics in europe right um we have um um let's say automotive and we do this now in nigeria uh we cannot that easily move the things so and when we spoke about <clears throat> reshoring i think we need to do smart shoring and i come to that um your reshoring doesn't mean what um i'm sitting sitting in the congo or i'm sitting in colombia reshoring means something else than i think most people on this uh, on this let's event uh think about uh the the concept so so for, i and you hear that i'm a promoter of globalization because it has brought us where we are even at the beginning of the pandemic where we didn't have enough medical equipment here enough uh, globes there i said should we now do in every country 
uh, what we did on a global level and produce there, it's very easy to run the, the numbers and you will see either if we talk about inflation now and think, oh, we have built an engine which now creates inflation. Wait until you have reshored everything. Then you see inflation, right? Uh, so that's that's it's not directly answering your question, but it's uh, mapping out the landscape we are facing. When we, are, when we talk about reshoring, reshoring, it would mean building a new ecosystem. Uh, so, mm. and, and doing this, yeah, it takes 10, 20 years. Some say we are already two, three years in the process. Are we really? Uh, how many companies have really left China? Uh, so that's, uh, that's a bit my, my two cents at the beginning of this panel. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Wolfgang. I think those are very important points. Smart sharing. It's going to take ten to twenty years before we can actually get there. And of course, like you said, how many companies have actually left China? I think economics will finally triumph, and uh, economics are going to drive a lot of the decision making. And uh, I liked uh, some of the points you raised here, but maybe the other panel members we could jump in when you uh, when I ask you and we could then go forward. Uh, thank you very much for your inputs. I think they're very valuable. A nice start to the uh, to the meeting. Uh, Donnie, uh, I come to you. China has so far been an integral part of the global supply chain owing to its ability to leverage the industrial or business cluster. The business cluster that China built is admired by everybody, you know. How does cluster help uh, bring down the overall cost and improve the supply chain? Thank you, uh, Richard. I, I uh, capitalize on and carry on, elaborate on the Wolfgang's comment. How many people left China and why Chinese China able to do that? So based on my uh, uh, observation and reading, China is building like what Wolfgang mentioned the terms ecosystem. The Chinese... Um, Based on my research, this, the latest number I, I, I read is there are 871 industrial clusters across the country. This is maybe over, so near a thousand clusters in making from iPhone to pencils and even to coffins. You, just one example, Japanese 90% of a Japanese coffin imported from a small town in Shandong province. Can you believe that? So this is Chinese, the building is, so that what, where the clusters emerge is the result of a 40 years reform. And uh, it's, it's, it, it created a, from a very small family business in the very beginning and building, for example, they get an order from making a mechanic and then they get people, a whole family village together to figure out how to make the mechanic works. So they spread it out, everybody to a different part. So they, they continue like this, slowly they become a, a, a cluster that like an ecosystem making mechanics. They, so what important, one thing is very important for, for people to understand. So that, that culture, the value in there is that we make one penny, we share. If we, we lose one penny, we share. Those ideas is, is not unique in China. It started in Japan and Korea as well. It's Confucian ethics. So in, in 70s, 60s and 70s, when Japanese products are flooded with US market and European market, it's a similar strategy. They, it's, a, it's also the family type of a cluster. They make the, they're able to make it so cheap and decent quality. So they, they, they all group together. Everybody made a piece of it. And they, even we have a one penny and then everybody share. So this is kind of a um, philosophy and how words. They, they evolve the cluster from a very beginning making low quality products and then some company, some family, they actually go out, they, they kids go to, go to schools in Europe, so on the United States. When they return, they see that the, 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 how the different 
uh, way of making. So they upgraded. So they purchased most advanced technology to China to make it. So then they keep upgrading. So now, this is why uh, I just started like one company right now. If you checked it out, then your daughter or your kid your, will know it. It's called S H E I N Shang. This is the one of the. This is the most downloaded uh, e-commerce apps. So it sell all high your fast fashion clothes less than ten U.S. dollars. How can it happen? You can you you just go. It's American Europe market is crazy about this. So these especially young. So their value. The only 10 years old, the value of the company put together is, is, a, is a higher than uh, H-A, H&M and Zara put together. So this is why it happened. is because they all the ecosystem built around Guangzhou area. It, it creates all the product they shared. They're creating whole system, ecosystem. They, what most important, they share profit together. So if if the if the platform made one dollar, they should spread it out with everybody, and equal and transparent. So that create an engines for that uh, cost effective, and, and and maintain outside the world the high quality. So this is the, the way uh, for you to understand. This is the mistakes of a Chinese cheap products, a cheap a cheap but decent products. Okay, I will just I will stop here and then waiting for other other people to because they are very hardworking and willing to take very minimum uh, profit. So thank you, uh, Donnie. Uh, I think uh, it was a good uh, introduction on to clusters. I personally experienced it. Uh, I've seen it in certain products where Chinese have come to the Indian market cheaper yeah. and with better quality than some produced in India and uh, still and taken over market share. So it's that's the reality of life. Uh, but thanks for ex- explaining on this cluster thing. It's it's big, thousand almost thousand clusters. Amazing, actually. Uh, Barry, I'll come to you now. Post COVID, people's view on life and livelihood has changed. Now people think they can die anytime, so let's enjoy life. Why do we need to save? In view of this, how can industry recalibrate its relationship with its employees in order to make them more engaged and have a happier workforce? Uh, uh, Barry, you're on mute. Barry, you're on mute. Hi. Um, I'd actually like to uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, what our fellow panelists said first. I think there's some interesting cases here in Japan, which is where I'm based. Particularly, um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned, and I don't think in our discussions before, is the case of nationalism and uh, the supply chain. And that certain, we can certainly see that in the case here. In the fashion industry, um, there are several examples within Japan of, of folks taking um, uh, manufacturing capabilities uh, outside and bringing it back to Japan. You can argue that uh, you know, the, the weak yen or inflationary pressures other places, um, you know, et cetera, uh, have a lot to do with that. But I think we can really say that a lot of what we've seen post-COVID is something like a, a barium test that you take. You know, all these things are there, um, but when you take the barium, you, everything kind of lights up and you can see all the problematic areas. And this actually ties into uh, into what I would say about kind of the post-COVID uh, order. I mean, my territory is I'm an executive search consultant. I run a company that that does that. And I think that what's useful in, in my perspective is that I can, you know, people have to actually make things um, that I see what people are doing and not doing. I think that in a nutshell, you know, employers need to pay more and they need to pay more attention. Um, you know, there's nothing new, you know, kind of post-COVID, you know, workers wanting more work-life a better work-life balance, flexibility, and so forth. You know, marginalized communities need to have better environments to to realize their potential. I think that what has changed is that workers feel as if they have stronger collective bargaining power and are willing to use it. 
Um, you know, we have a lot of talk about the great resignation. And I know that we spoke about this before. Um, and in, in the U.S., uh, I think it's less about people resigning. And I think that we can now see that most people are coming back anyway, that they resign. But it's about people seeking more equitable and more favorable uh, work environments. Here in Japan, I know there hasn't been a great resignation. People will talk about it, but I haven't seen any evidence of it. Um, uh, uh, you know, again, I, I would say that there's a lot to take into account here. You know, we need flexibility. All this stuff is is very useful. But from the observations of my own work, I would say that company loyalty is not rewarded. Um, and I see this very clearly. And I think this has deep, deep implications for the supply chain is that in both the U.S. and Japan, um, that employees advance much more slowly in terms of promotion and pay if they stay in the same job. I see this over and over again. Um, people aren't changing jobs and quitting because, you know, for no reason at all. They're doing it because they feel that they can get better terms elsewhere, and that's exactly what they're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, and I see that staying in the same job punishes people in terms of their career over and over again. Uh, you know, I think that employers generally have to, again, there's no, nothing, no secrets here. They need to listen to their employees and give them the kind of flexibility and opportunity that they're demanding. Otherwise, they're simply going to leave and they're going to do so now more than they ever have. So there's no, there's no choice but to listen. Uh, thank you, uh, Barry, uh, for that. Uh, uh, can I ask you one question, follow-up question on this? Um, while you did speak about there's no loyalty from a corporate side, uh, what do you think, uh, how can this workforce be kept or you know, the people who work in a company more engaged in a company? Is there anything that may be required there or uh, you think? Well, I think there are a number of things and we have two sets of questions. I was going to yes. yeah. address some of that. But I think that overall, what has been effective is general flexibility in working hours, sure. um, childcare arrangements, teleworking sure. has increased um, work satisfaction quite markedly. Um, sure. Again, not every profession can do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are just some... Sure. You know, yeah. We, we will like cover it in the next breaks. round. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, thanks, Barry. And I think uh, company loyalty is uh, it loyalty is two sides. It can't be one way, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Hugo, let me come to you. Uh, Hugo, on reshoring, uh, we've heard Wolfgang talk. We have heard uh, even Donny say some things around that. You know that reshoring is not easy because it will require unwinding of current structures, putting back new structures. Everything is very expensive. But it would also require, besides putting the structures, you'll require the workforce, right? So there'll be huge amount of um, immigration policies and visa requirements which would need to be changed because people will need to come there and work. Do you think the governments would be able to react and respond swiftly to address this issue? I guess, uh, I mean, using the word of reshoring uh, has... It's used like this, but I do feel that uh, we have different options so below this name of reshoring. So starting um, one piece, I mean, if uh, uh, there is a tool called VMI, Vendor Managed Inventory, so also on a long supply chain, like from China to Europe, as example, or to the United States. I think it could also, reshoring could also require having more products in the destination market for different clients uh, in a buffer stock. This is something coming back. Uh, we all uh, reduce stocks over the last 20, 30 years because it costed too much money. Now, I agree, fast-moving uh, electronic stuff like chips, uh, you cannot store it too long because uh, within three months, you have uh, 
better and newer chips and 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 so making a stock for one year that's not possible but for the chips we can do much more in air freight than today in ocean freight uh, to 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 help so uh reshoring could mean uh, vmi it could mean also more storage on our side uh, which uh, is uh, costly so we have to rebuild warehouses again uh coming back a little bit in all the times i feel under the name of reshoring that uh, in a lot of ports robotic is discussed 3d printing is discussed uh i think that the situation we had over the last two three years and now with the new problem uh, with this uh, war in the ukraine uh we will have to learn that money itself in the supply chain is not the only factor so we talk probably about resilience of uh, supply chain which we have then to look in in many other things too is it because you talk about the government of reshoring i think what a government can do much easier than now to move uh, millions of people around the world uh is it absolutely necessary to privatize all ports is the framework to be set about port operation which is a big problem we have today um only in private hands or do we have a government steering in this and cross world to cover our needs uh, talking backups and uh, alternatives is it in our interest to have almost a monopoly in shipping around the world uh, we are today in a situation where a container from china to europe we paid up to $17,000 a container prior to covid it was about 3000 dollars a container actually you can get it between 11 and 12000 that's uh, very nice it came down but uh, uh, the price alone doesn't help you still need space on a boat and uh, i'm also every day on the phone for friends and companies to see <laughs> that their stuff gets moving due to personal relations you have with the different people and say this one must go first and then and i mean it's it, it's catastrophic and the catastrophe in, in 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 the shipping situation will not ease because uh, i understand south korea is building now lng ships foremost they are much more profitable than any other ships okay there are other ships iPad we will see what the impact will be on the newer ships coming out because uh, with the IMO regulations uh, and agreements uh, for the green act uh, the shipping industry committed to a certain output of CO2 uh with the actual ships and the new ships if we want to really commit to the co2 level which has been agreed we will uh stretch out the transit times of these new ships uh, considerably so uh, far east to europe you have 10 days more transit uh, there is no ship to be bought on the market because all big ones who made a fortune in the meantime uh, you have uh, merck klein making about 20 billion uh, profit in one year uh, the other two it's not far away uh, they are buying up every ship in the market uh, which is existing even smaller one yeah so we're going to have uh, three four decision centers in the world for the equipment and so i see a lot of government uh, framework you know i don't like too much government regulations and all this etc but uh, let's pronounce it framework and uh, on this framework the governments will have to work uh, because we are 
going from one crisis and another crisis, and it's multiple factors. However, I believe uh, in the reassuring a lot that uh, 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 Reliance uh, supply chain has different origins, uh, that uh, we can uh, deal with local issues. Uh, uh, and this is not all very, only always China. And so if you look at the chemical industrial part in Southern uh, America, one hurricane <laughs> brings us crisis all over the world. Uh, so we really have to think in it, and uh, I think companies can do at the moment much more in uh, not only chasing the cheapest price, but to negotiate also with all suppliers worldwide, how do we get stuff more res uh, resilient? And more resilient means more money. Uh, it's as simple as this. Now, to the question the government has to do, we just said there are many other frameworks uh, stuff government should do now. In Europe, our first priority is at the moment the energy sector, uh, which takes a lot of resources right now because uh, this is uh, highly important. Uh, again, uh, reshoring with robots and 3Ds and uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, even if it's certain things are more expensive, uh, it can be used in crisis, it can be used uh, for uh, lower, faster, but lower production cycles. I just saw last week a huge industrial company in uh, Switzerland where they uh, make ma machine parts uh, before the mole to, to make, uh, what, three, four uh, months. Uh, they do it now with 3D uh, printers in, in, in sand, the positive to make the negative out of it, uh, which allows them within two, three weeks to do the job of three, four months before. So there is revolutionary stuff coming, and uh, uh, at the end we have to decide what do we produce where, in which uh, quantity, uh, having backup, having uh, um, yes, certain productions also locally, and you know, uh, India. If we look into the production of antibiotics, etc. Uh, it would be foolish to produce all antibiotics in the future in Europe because you can do that uh, better and cheaper. But we need to have also backup systems here uh, if we get into a problem there. I mean, look, masks, a very simple uh, thing. We were running out of it. We couldn't get it. We paid fortunes for masks. Importers of masks, they are driving number VVs today in Ferraris. And finally, we found out in uh, Switzerland, I uh, know three of these uh, mask uh, producing lines now, which are installed. Uh, it's, of course, much more expensive to produce these masks here in Switzerland. So we will continue to buy them in China. But if should you have another uh, pandemic and an end, then uh, I think we can help each other dually because we also have a couple of machines standing around, which in the emergency case will be amortized very quickly. By yeah. the way, China helped us a lot. I got sure. from Sino Pharma three jumbo jets of masks for Switzerland for our hospitals, and uh, they helped us a lot at the time. But of course, uh, you know, with all. Already the Chumbo itself will pay the half a minute. So. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Jumbo. Yeah, Hugo, you, you thank you very much. I think you've given a lot of inputs. Um, the two takeaways for me is VMI and, of course, you're saying privatization of ports and the shipping. I think those are some important uh, points, plus many other important points you've raised here. Uh, you've made us look at differently how do you do reshoring and how do you look at just pricing and you know quality is also important. Uh, Barry, can I come to you now on the question, which uh, was that how do employers, what do employers need to do now that the workforce is not physically with you? 
I mean, it is spread across at different locations. They are working at different places, work from home, work from anywhere. How do employers re-engage with their employees? And are there any models which are working better than others in your experience? Barry, un uh, unmute, please. Yes, let me go very quickly here because I know that our yes. time is... Yes, uh, yes, sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, employee engagement is really hugely uh, important. I mean, that higher wages and flexibility are, are a given, so let's, let's move on from that. Yes. I mean, like, in, just just as a, a in Japan, uh, only 5% of employees feel engaged in their work, and 43% that they've never improved in their job, and 53% have reported that uh, they have no intention of improving their skills. So there's something going on here. Um, I didn't make that up either. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think that, you know, overall, there needs to be a new social contract. I don't mean to sound like uh, the, the radical hippie that I am, but um, that, uh, you know, greater work-life balance, workers' rights, caring about training and, and for the future, uh, fair and transparent compensation, I think is hugely important in evaluations, you know, listening to, to uh, uh, your employees, et cetera. I think that as a practical matter, again, I'm going to go really fast, is that um, uh, teleworking where it's possible is really important. I think that 85% uh, of Japanese employees that are teleworking like it um, up two years from 57%. That's because people are getting used to it. In the US, that's going down a lot from about 35% two years ago to about 7% now. So that's going to be an issue. When I was a headhunter, when, when companies say they're bringing folks back to the office, that means that I can go take their employees. Um, Four-day work week, uh, I think, has been um, very useful in a lot of cases. Again, if you're loading boxes, that's not going to work. But for a lot of, 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 of folks, that's um, going to be very useful. A lot of experimentation with that. 100% um, remote. We talked about that. But Airbnb, when they did that, they got like a trillion more applications for their jobs uh, before. Um, you know, again, just general transparency and respect. I think we'll be just, sorry, I don't hope I didn't take up too much time. Barry, for that uh, quick snapshot um, and uh, some new, I mean, that statistics are revealing actually, and that would be, and that would be across many countries actually, just not, this was Japan, I presume, right? This uh, mm -hmm. survey. Yeah, so I think this would be valid across um, many countries because. Uh, uh, this is the new workforce we are dealing with. Uh, Wolfgang, uh, can I come to you, please? Uh, uh, we heard uh, you go talk a lot on the supply chain. And uh, I think you started off on the supply chain. So what can we learn uh, from the COVID-19 crisis, you know, when the supply chains broke uh, in many parts of the world or we found them not to be so good? Are there any learnings we can take going forward and try to get some permanent fixes on it? Yeah, based on what has been said, um, I, um, I would like to, to build on a few points. I hear the privatization of ports. Um, I'm running uh, expert networks conversations with people all over the world. And uh, on Tuesday, uh, we spoke with an expert of ports in the UK. The big problem in the UK is that the ports are private. So what you need is coordination. Now our ports Overloaded containers are stuck. They have all kinds of operations. There's not enough infrastructure. There are not enough yards. It's a total disaster. Uh, and of course, this is very driven by crack. But I would be careful with privatization. There is no black and white in life. Right? You need to find the right balance. That's one thing. Um, the other learning is the Global supply chain is a self organizing system. It balances itself out. Uh, you can do maybe some things, but if I look at 2000, uh, 2020, 2021, which was a little bit better, I think that governments interfered very much in how supply chains could work, and that created a lot of mess. So, again, I would be careful with. Uh, believing that we can just change the global supply chain, right? It's a self-organizing system, highly complex, highly fragmented. And currently, I run, made the last point, 
uh, it's not directly a learning from from Cavendish learning, but it's a, a, a finding um, from what Hugo mentioned, which is sustainability or decarbonization. I just did a study on decarbonization industry. Again, extremely complex topic. But and we looked into different scenarios. The world could evolve. The world that drives on capitalism is one scenario. The world that drives on thrives on sustainability is another one. And then there is a fragmented world, uh, which is everybody does what for himself. Let's say Switzerland first, Germany first, France first. Such a fragmented world will be extremely, extremely slow, creates a lot of disruptions in everything that is global because the companies need then, need then to deal with the French regulation, the German regulation, the US regulation, the Japan regulation with different carbon trading systems, uh, different priorities on fuels, uh, you need different type of shit. Everything becomes super complex, super expensive, super slow. So, and then maybe my last point is uh, no, not everything, everything that's global, right? And there are a lot of global things in our life, in, including save our oceans, fighting the climate, right? So, and the last point is, uh, it is in fact, always that South global, South global, North debate. When we are having the debate on, yeah, we change the supply chain so that we have more resilience, etc. We can do that because we are the rich, the rich, we in the West, we are the rich countries. But just think what will happen with, um, with the poorer countries. Our prices go up, their prices go up five times, right? So we have to think that and what that means for us. Again, I think, I think it's all about smart decisions and taking the time to think things through, taking the the national, and Barry, you mentioned it, right? Uh, the national uh, element out. Think collectively. A lot learn, or a lot, the biggest learning of the last 10 years, probably, um, starting with the, the trade wars, etc., is we have moved more and more into a fragmented world and more and more into bigger problems. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, Hugo, can I come to you? You spoke a lot on this reshoring and other areas, actually. So do you think some shorter supply chains, like, uh, you know, getting Africa, South America into some of those, would that be more helpful? Or are there any other thoughts around this? I mean, using all resources we have would make it more resilient. There's no doubt you, you use other ships to Africa or South America. There are smaller ships. Uh, the turnaround is uh, uh, shorter, so it will be more flexible too, etc. Uh, we have an influx uh, of people out of these two areas into Europe and America. And I think uh, people would be happier to work at home than to immigrate either to Europe or to uh, uh, America. So uh, what Wolfgang said uh, before, it's a global matter. We have to look at it globally. Uh, investment is always shy due to political situations, which we have in these countries there. Uh, yes, uh, I do follow some projects in Africa which are successful in some countries, but this is a very small portion today of what is happening. Uh, it's part of an overall look of the supply chain of the future. And uh, as I said, the name reshoring, we take it as a chapter, but that can mean many things. Uh, I would rather uh, prefer a resilient uh, supply chain, smart and not always cheaper. And, you know, as long as we only pay buyers uh, end of the year their bonus, whenever they bought cheapest, we are not going to change anything. So we have to put our brains together in a company, and as it is, the fish smells top down. 
Uh, the boards also have to agree. We have to spend more money on it. And this will be also more social in the future too, if we spend more money on it. And uh, I hope over the next years, uh, top down, we get to this. Maybe somebody will invent a label for resilient uh, supply chains. So when you buy your product, you know, it was not only fair label, uh, labor, it was also a good supply chain. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hugo. I think that is a nice one you ended with. Somebody branding a resilient supply chain. And uh, uh, I think it may come true. I think the way we are going through the challenges, I'm sure we can see it. May I request other panelists who are not speaking just to put your thing on mute? It's echoing, if you don't mind. If uh, Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Donnie, just to come to the last question, and I know we have, we have just at the fag end of this thing. Uh, how do you see the situation changing for China? Uh, one side, uh, COVID pandemic, ongoing Russia, Ukraine crisis, COVID-related shutdown in China, which is actually impacting. We've just been talking about it, impacting global supply chain in a big way. No chips being available. You are the largest manufacturer of semiconductors now. Uh, so uh, any views on that, please? Yes. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Richard. I really uh, uh, like uh, Wolfgang's uh, ideas that, you know, the globalization we should enforce and, and, and encourage, uh, advocate globalization. Everybody doing their the best and good at it. But that things happen, you know, in the... Like what you're saying, everybody you know become fragmented. Everybody become nationalism. Like Barry say, is playing into it. Everybody want to you know think about national security. Everybody so semiconductor China, actually the largest semiconductor importer. You know import forty percent of the world um, semiconductors. So China actually buying sixty percent almost American chips they made. So this is market, and now it's shut down. You know that China not cannot buy anything because the the American care afraid of the national security. So what happens right now is I was thinking that in the future, what China is happening is that one thing is a diversifying. Diversifying coming from uh, multinationals. For example, European company, like I just read a report from the European Chamber of Commerce coming out. They're saying that 23% of European company in China thinking about, thinking about relocating some of the manufacturing facility outside China. And for some of them, 40% of them are thinking about it. So then that is diversifying. And because of the China, that everybody think about in like what uh, Hugo is saying, they wanted to maintain this, uh, the resilience, you know, in, in case risk management is very important. So um, another, another thing I'm seeing that is that uh, in, the, in the digital eyes, so the manufacturing, the supply chain is moving up to the digital, uh, you know, digital is to become artificial intelligence play an important part of it. I give you an example like China. China Lenovo is the world largest PC manufacturer. Uh, my friend told me that after pandemic, eighty percent of the order coming in, eighty percent is less than five computer order. Five is order. Eighty percent of order is only five computers. So how can you a uh, uh, factory to ma to make like this? It's very cost if you know heavy, and then you can't do it. So they have to figure it out using artificial intelligence to figure it out if we made two com two computer in an order how to play order how to sh how to get parts. So they actually spend at almost on one and a half years now. This year they completed use artificial intelligence with two minutes. They calculate the order that where the parts coming from is at 100, he told me, 50,000 parts for making two computers. So, so they, they, how, get, how they can come for, for two computers. So this is a new way of manufacturing so that digitalized is a new train for, for supply chain move upwards. So use artificial intelligence, high tech. Another one I'm seeing is like what um, uh, Wolfgang mentioned is green. So another, for all the European, American, uh, the buyers, they wanted the green. So when the, when the products are being uh, very healthy, uh, very uh, net, you know, climate conscious. So China actually huge, a big way to doing push the, the manufacturers to move upwards that make it green. 
government supply, uh, supply, you know, like, uh, like, like subsidize that the process, you know, to help the manufacturers to move into more green. For example, I, I just a few years ago, they, they actually give for free for generators to save the electricity. Because the church is usually going to give you a free one. It can save electricity. The government just give you a free one. So they replace all the uh, generator, power generator who consume more electricity. So this kind of activity government is doing heavily subsidize the factories that are able to make it more green. They, they, they have to, China committed that um, the carbon neutral in uh, 2060. So it's, uh, it's, very, ha- it's very heavy uh, for China. It's very difficult. That's why an Indian not come, you know, come in much lower. Because we are, like what you say, I really like uh, Wolfgang's comment. You guys have a trouble. We have five times more trouble. You know, that's why we have to fight. So that the supply chain, another way of moving is that how can we see more green? And China uh, is moving, is very difficult. So that's why we're seeing uh, another, in a political, geopolitical reason, nationalism, and the world become fragmented. So everything compounds, and China is that I would I, I don't see the Chinese government say we're going to maintain five point maintain a five point five uh, increase in this year. Uh, it's very difficult. You know, lockdown in Shanghai in one month it costs it costs about China GDP about three percent, and now you know that China contribute to twenty five to to thirty percent the world GDP growth, and then China two three percent for China. That's why uh, Hugo have a problem, you know, getting the goods because if everything's shut down. But the good things in our China is slowly to open it up now. Is for Shanghai. So it's uh, is uh, I already mentioned to 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 um to um uh, to uh, Richard about China's zero COVID uh, policy is coming from Chinese culture point of view because I everybody mean, know that those who die from the COVID are very elderly people. Who those who are elder than 80% is the most heavily hit. And Chinese culture and Japan as well, I think the Asians, were really, uh, how to say, cautious or conscious, conscientious about elder people got killed because that create a trauma in the society that we don't care about elderly people. That's why government, they, they really hold it. They say, we cannot let the elderly people die because even though they are weak, so this is the logic behind the Chinese uh, uh, that, that zero policy people don't understand why Chinese so harsh on it because of our culture say we cannot let the elderly people die. That's why we willing to sacrifice our economy. We, otherwise, if we let it go, there will be four to five million elderly people will die, and then that will create a, a, a kind of a cultural, you know, a kind of a punch to Chinese people that say we let the elderly people die. And government is incompetent to protecting elderly people, weak people. This is why we pay pr- protecting weak people, weaker group of a society. So this is giving a logic of why Chinese doing little, uh, you know, against the against the art, you know, doing all these different things. So about the different policies to doing little, even sacrifice the economic growth for you know for to live for four or five million of elderly populations. That's what the logic behind. Okay, so I will just give you a point. I think that three things we're gonna. Why I see that China will say diversify. I think that will relocated to Japan, uh, to to Vietnam, to India. Like now, I I read the news that Germany spent uh, ten billion U.S. Uh, Euro, Europe to invest in 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 India to uh, to kind of cultivate the supply chains, and in and 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 uh, Japan as well. You know that is helping is diversifying. Second is digitalized, and third is uh, is a green. I think that China is moving uh, more green for the supply chain, uh, uh, the manufacturing. Okay, that's one. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much to all the panel members. I think it was a very meaningful discussion. I think a lot of learnings for everybody whoever has been listening into it, and uh, wish you all all the best. And uh, uh, thank you very much again. Thank you. Uh, keep, in, keep in touch. Yeah. Keep in touch. Yes, really yes we we'll keep in touch. Yes. yes. Okay, okay really thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.